practice of using AI to generate metadata has been around for almost a decade now. Even with pretty sophisticated and high quality platforms and tools, it's still fair to say that the hype has far outpaced the adoption and utilization. My guest today is Aaron Edel from Wasabi. Aaron is one of the folks that is working on making AI so easy to use that we collectively glide over the hurdle of putting effort into using AI and find ourselves happily reaping the rewards without ever having had to do much work to get there. It's interesting to note the commonalities and approach with both Aaron and the AMP project folks who I spoke with a couple of episodes ago. Both looked at this problem and aimed to tackle it by bringing together a suite of AI tools into a platform that orchestrates their capabilities to produce a result that is greater than the sum of their individual parts. Aaron is currently the SVP of AI at Wasabi. Prior to this, he was the CEO of Gray Meta, served as the global head of business and GTM at Amazon Web Services, and was involved in multiple AI and ML businesses in founding and leadership roles. Aaron's current focus is on the Wasabi Air platform, which they announced just before I interviewed him. I think you'll find his insights to be interesting and thought-provoking. He's clearly someone who has thought about this topic a lot, and he has a lot to share that listeners will find valuable and fun. Before we dive in, I would really appreciate it if you would take two seconds to follow, rate, or subscribe on your platform of choice. And remember, damn right, because it's too important to get wrong. Aaron Edel, welcome to the Damn Right Podcast. Great to have you here. It's an honor. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm very excited to talk to you today You for a number of reasons. Uh, one, uh, you've recently announced a really exciting development at Wasabi. Uh, can't wait to talk about that. But also, our, our career paths have, have paralleled and intersected in kind of strange ways uh, over the past couple of decades. Um, we both have... Uh, a career start and an intersection around uh, a guy by the name of Jim Lindner, who was the yes. founder of Vidipax, a place that I worked for uh, a number of years before I started AVP, and who was also the founder of SAMA, where where uh, you kind of, uh, I won't say you started there, you had a career before that, but uh, that's where our intersection started. But I'd love, yes. I'd love for you to tell me a bit about um, your, your history um, that brought you in your path that brought you to where you are today. Yeah, definitely. Um, it, the other funny thing about Jim is that he is a, a fellow tall person. Mm. So, you know, folks who are listening to this can't tell, but I'm six foot six and I believe Jim is also six, six or maybe six, seven. Uh, so, you know, when you get to that height, there's a little Wi-Fi that goes on between people <laughs> of a similar height that you just make a little connection. You kind of look at each other and go, I know your pain. I know, I know your back hurts. <laughs> Um, so I, I, um, you know, my, my whole life growing up ever since really I was five years old, I loved vi video recording, shooting movies, filming things. Um, I eventually went to college for it. I did it a lot in high school. I, I, would, I and this is back in the early nineties when, you know, video editing was hard and, you know, the kid in high school who knew how to do it and had the Mac who could do it, uh, what, you know, was kind of the only person able to, to actually create content. So I was, I was rarefied, I guess, in that sense. So I would go to film festivals and all sorts, and it was just great time. And, and I, I was never very good at it. I just really loved it. Mm. And, you know, when you love something, especially when you're young, you learn all of the things you need to know to accomplish that. So I learned a lot about digital video just because I had to figure out how to get my stupid Mac to record and transcode and and then i i got introduced to nonlinear editing very early on and, and learning that so when i went to college i went there for film and film and video really that was what i thought i wanted to be when i grew up was a filmmaker um my father was a uh, was talent for kgo television and abc news um for a long time so i had some familial and my, my mother was the executive producer of his radio show oh cool so i i had a lot of like familial um, sort of media and entertainment world around um, and was very supported in that way, I suppose. By the time I got, so I, <laughs> I went to college and I loved my college. Hampshire College is a fantastic institution. It has no tests, no grades. It has a complete, you, you design your own education, yeah. which is not something I was prepared for, by the way, when I went there. Uh, I'm so thrilled I went there because all of my entrepreneurial success is because of what I learned there. But at the time, I had no appreciation for that. And I just thought, well, this is strange. 
I'm here for film and video. And they're like, here's a camera, uh-huh. here's the recording button. And I thought, mm, you know, this is, a, this is an expensive private college in Massachusetts and, you know, probably need to make it a little bit harder. So my, my father is a physician. So I thought, you know, pre-med and I did it. I went full on pre-med. Oh, I wow. was going to be a doctor. I was, pl- I was going to apply to medical school, but I was also working on documentaries and producing stuff and acting in other people's, you know, films and things like that. So I still, that, that love, that passion never went away. Yeah. I was just kind of being creative about how to do it. And my thesis project ended up being a documentary about a medical subject, which was kind of perfect. Um, because at the end of the day, my, my father, he's a physician, but he's actually a medical reporter. And that, that's a, you know, that's a whole separate field that, that fascinated me. So when I graduated, I was like, okay, I went, I went and actually got a job producing and editing a show for PBS, which was super cool in New York city. And, um, that was around 2000, right around 2008. We, I was doing it for a couple of years and we were, you know, it was a PBS show. So we were very reliant on, on donations and, and whatnot. And, you know, 2008 financial crisis, it dried up. We ran out of money and I was looking for a job and I worked on a couple of movies that were being shot in the city. And I found this job at this weird co- company called Sama Systems on 10th Avenue in, you know, 33rd Street or something that was make, that was, Jim Linder's company that I came to learn later, but they were making these robotic systems that would migrate video cassette tapes to a digital format, right? So, you know, think, think of a bunch of tape decks on top of each other with a gripper going up and down and pulling videotapes out of a library, putting them in, waiting for them to be digitized, taking them out, cleaning them, not in that order, but essentially that way. Mm-hmm. And, um, I, I, I was just fascinated. I mean, it was so cool. I, building robots, yeah, you know, video, right. like it just, it was everything I loved kind of in one and the rest is just really history from there. Yeah. So, uh, w- w- we have another intersection that I didn't know about, which was Hampshire college, although I was denied by Hampshire college. So you, you, okay. you definitely went up to me on that, which, uh, <laughs> Bill, I taught at wow. NYU in the MIOP program and Bill Brand also taught there also taught at Hampshire college. And I told him that I was denied by yes. Hampshire college. And he said, I didn't know they denied people from Hampshire college. <laughs> oh, <that makes it worse. laughs> anyway, all, all, all things happen for a reason. It was all good. Uh, but that's very cool. That is a great school. Uh, and what a fascinating history uh, there. So, so it's not. I mean, I, I still think there's let's connect the dots between you know working for a company that was doing mass digitization of audiovisual, um, and where you are today uh, at Wasabi. Mm-hmm. Like that, it's not necessarily uh, easy to fill in that gap. So, tell us a little bit about how that happened. Yes. Well, as my father likes to say, you know, life is simply a river. You just jump in and kind of flow down and you end up where you end up. I I don't think I could have engineered or controlled this, you know, if I could jump, you know, Sama, this was 2008. So it's almost 20 years ago. If I could jump back, you know, and say to myself back then, this is where you're going to end up. I would just been like, how that's, how do you do that? How is that possible? (laughs) Right. Um, So this is what happened. I mean, I, you know, Sama was very quickly acquired by a company called Front Porch Digital in 2000, actually it was 2008, I think, or now very close to 2009. And Front Porch Digital, you know, created these products that were, the, the core product was called Diva Archive, which still still exists today, although it's owned by Telestream. But essentially it is, you know, you've got your your LTO tape robot and you've got your your disc storage and you have, you're a, you're a broadcaster. And you need some system to keep track of where all of these files and digital assets live and exist. And you've got to build in rules, like take it off spinning disk if it's old. Make sure that there's always two or three LTO tape backups. Mm-hmm. You know, transcode a copy for my man over here. Uh, automation wants some video clip for the news segment, you know, pr- you know, pull it off tape and put it here. All of that kind of stuff is was the Diva Archive software. And I'm oversimplifying, but yeah. Uh, through that process, you know, I was, I, I joined as the, I was kind of bottom of the rung, like support engineer. And I had delivered some SAMA systems, you know, and installed some and did a little product managing um, just because we were, you know, we needed it. We were only eight people. And I was probably the most knowledgeable of the system other than one or two people at the time. And so by the time I got to, to Front Porch Digital, um, you know, I was doing demos and I was, I was architecting solutions for customers. So I was 
promoted to a solutions architect. And that's kind of where I learned, you know, business, just like generic business stuff, p ls mm-hmm. quotes. Um, I learned about the tech industry and media and entertainment industry in particular and how, you know, how sales works in those industries uh, and how it doesn't work uh, sometimes. <laughs> Um, and all of the products that are that are involved. So I, I was kind of, you know, getting a real good crash course of just how media and entertainment works from a tech perspective and how to be a vendor in the space. Um, I did a brief stint at New Lion. For those of you who don't know New Lion, I don't think it exists anymore, but it was a company based in Long Island that kind of pioneered some of the uh, uh, like set top box digital video fast channel stuff. And then, um, but but I was I was more or less at Front Porch for about seven years, and then Front Porch was acquired by Oracle. And um, working at Oracle was a very different experience. You know, they they are a very very large company, and they have a lot of products. Um, and I, I don't know, I just it just didn't feel like I could do my scrappy startup thing, which yeah. I had kind of spent the last ten years honing. So that is so so you know. That is kind of at the point where I, um, a, a sales guy that I had worked with at Front Porch named Tim Stockhouse, went went off to ca- to California to start this company called Gray Meta, based on this idea that we that we we were we were all kind of floating around, which is, man, metadata is a real problem in the industry right now, especially as it relates to archives and finding things. So Gray Meta was founded on that idea. When I joined there, I was the first or second employee. So. Mm. It was, we were building it from scratch. And I mean, building everything, not just the product or the technology, but the sales motions that go to market. Yeah. And that's, that's where I learned all that stuff. I quit Gray Meta uh, about two years in to go start my own startup because I just wanted to do it. I wanted to be a founder. I wanted to know what that was like. Yeah. And I, at that point, had learned a lot about machine learning and how it applies to the media and entertainment industry, specifically around things like transcription and AI tags. And um, a couple of my uh, coworkers at Gray Meta, you know, had this really great idea that let's build our own machine learning models and make them Docker containers mm. and with that have their own API built in and their own interface and just make them run anywhere, run on prem, run in the cloud, wherever you want, because it solved a lot of the problems at the time. So we jumped ship, we built the company, it it exploded. I was the CEO, my founders were, um, you know, the the de- like the the technical leaders. And between the three of us, man, we were doing everything, sales, marketing, building, tech support, all of it. And gosh, what a learning experience. Also, as a founder and CEO, you're raising money. You know, you've got to figure out how the IRS works. You need to figure out how to incorporate stuff. So a whole nother learning experience mm-hmm. for me. Um, and then I, we sold uh, Machine Box to a company called Veritone in 2019 or something like that changed our lives. I mean, you know, we, we went through an acquisition. We, we walked away with a lot of money and it it was a whole new world. Like things open up, I guess, when that happens to you in business. And, and, um, I actually got recruited to join AWS. And the funny thing is, is that had nothing to do with media entertainment or AI Hmm. at all. Hmm. AWS said, Hey, you have a lot of experience taking situations where there's a lot of data and simplifying it for people or mm. building products to simplify it for people and make it like more consumable and understandable. AWS has that problem with their cost and usage data. Right. Oh, so, yeah, you know, right. Like you get a, when, especially if you use a lot of the, of the cloud and you're a big company, you get a bill. It's not really a bill. You get like this data dump. That's not human readable. It's billions of lines long, has hundreds of columns. You can't even open it in Excel. It's like, how do I use this? So yeah. AWS was like, go figure this out, man. Yeah. So we, I, I mean, gosh, it was such a great experience. We we built we built a whole business based on this idea. We built a product. We built a go-to-market function. Interesting. We, we changed how AWS and actually, I think, how the world consumes cloud spending. Mm-hmm. I think we had, a, we had a, that big of an impact, not to toot our own horn, but um, it, it was for me, for my career and my learning as a human, Wow. Like seeing how, how you can impact the whole world. Yeah. Well, with, as a with technology, as a consumer of AWS web services, I'll say thanks because the billing definitely improved dramatically over the past several years. 
Um, so I, I know exactly what you mean, uh, and I see the, the manifestation of your work there. I didn't realize, though, that that's what you were doing at AWS. I did always have in my mind that it was on the AI front. So that's really interesting that you kind of left AI. that. And then yeah. you're, you're, so in some ways, your role now uh, is, is kind of a combination of the two in the sense that Wasabi is a competitor to AWS. But you are very much in the AI, AI space. So tell us about what you're doing at, uh, at Wasabi now. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, it, it, it was your point is 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 really spot on because um, one of the biggest problems I think for customers of the cloud is that, and and I learned this thoroughly, was is that it's not forecastable and it's really hard to actually figure out what you're spending money on, and th it's also can be expensive if you do it wrong. There there really is a right way to do cloud and mm -hmm. a wrong way, and it's not always obvious how to how to navigate that. So when I first came across, so, you know, I, 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 Gray Meta, the board of Gray Meta called me while I was at AWS, you know, kind of chugging along and said, Hey, Aaron, why don't you come and be CEO? And I thought, you know what, that's scary, but it's also like, it, it's perfect because it, it, the Gray Meta story, I feel like we never got to finish telling it. Mm -hmm. I left, you know, before we got to finish telling it. And so I came back and I said, guys, I've, I've now had the experience of creating our own machine learning models and running a machine learning company, like one that actually makes AI and solves problems. Let's do that. Mm. So that's when I met Wasabi. It was very shortly after I came back. And you are totally right, because when I, when I met Wasabi, it, it, was, it was like like, the, like a door opening with all this you know, heavenly light coming through in terms of <laughs> Cloud FinOps because Wasabi is is you know cloud object storage just like S3 or, or Microsoft Blob that is just seven ninety nine a terabyte and uh, it's sorry six ninety nine a terabyte and and just totally predictable like yeah. you don't get charged for API fees you don't get charged for egress um, which which is where the kind of com complexity comes in for other hyperscalers in terms of cost optimization and, and understanding your cloud use and cloud spend. That's all the unpredictable stuff. Yeah. That's what makes it not forecastable. So, um, the fact that that you know Wasabi has just like a flat per terabyte per month pricing, and there's just nothing else. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just elegant and simple and beautiful and um, very compelling for the kind of experience I had in the and we call it the you know FinOps space or cloud FinOps space, uh, where all for three and a half years all I heard were problems yeah. about that, that this solved right so it just it just it pinged in my brain immediately interesting the connection with ai you know it, it goes back even further in the sense that i had always advocated for i always believed fundamentally that the metadata for an object and the object itself should be as closely held together as possible because uh when you start separating them and you and they're serviced by different vendors or whatever that's where the problems can seep in. Hmm. And one of the best analogies for this that um, I can think of is, you know, at our Wasabi CEO, Dave Friend, I love how he put it because he always refers to, you know, a library needs a card catalog, right? You go into the library and the card catalog is in the library. You don't go across the street to a different building for the card catalog, right? right? right. It's the same concept. I mean, it's obviously, you know, the physical world versus the virtual computer world, but Similar concept mm -hmm. in the sense that, you know, the metadata that describes your content, it should be as close to the content as possible, because if it's not, you know, you are you are at risk of losing data at the end of the day. I mean, I, I've talked to so many customers that have these massive libraries. Sometimes they're LTO libraries, sometimes they're other kinds of libraries where they've lost the database, right? And, and you know, in LTO, like you need a database. Yep. You need to know what objects are written on what tape. It's gone. Yeah. I mean, what do you do, right? right. You you're you're in such a bad it's such a bad spot to be in. So, hopefully we're addressing that. Yeah. So that's that's I I remember reading something on your website or maybe a spec sheet or something for Air which said uh object storage uh without cert, without a uh without a catalog is like is like the internet without a search engine or something. So, and to take that, yes. to tie that to your other analogy, it's like a library without a card catalog, right? You walk in, you just have to start pulling books off the of shelves and 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 seeing what you find. Although there, we have a lot of text-based information. When you when you pull a tape out of a box or a file off of a 
off of a server, uh, there's a lot more research to do than there is maybe w even with a book. So, yeah. Yes. Um, so tell me, uh, what does AIR stand for? It's a capital A, lowercase I, capital R. Tell us about that. What's that mean? So it, I believe it stands for AI recognition. Okay. And so the idea is that, so the product, Wasabi AIR, is this new product. And it's, you know, the, the kind of combination of the aqua so i guess we skipped the important part which is that wasabi acquired the curio um product and, and some of the people including myself came over and the curio product really was um this platform we called it a data platform if you will that when you pointed at video files and, and libraries and archives it literally it would do the job of opening up each file like you just said and watch essentially watching it you know logging, you know, taking it, making a transcript of all the speech, looking at OCR information. So, you know, recognizing text on screen, recording that down, pull, you know, pulling down faces, object recognition, basically creating a kind of rich metadata entry for each file. Mm -hmm. So this is where I think the, the, the kind of marriage between that technology and Wasabi comes in because you're, we now have a way of essentially with Wasabi Air, it's, you know, it's your standard object storage bucket. Now you can just say anything that's in that bucket, I want a, I want a metadata index for that will just do automatically with machine learning. And you have access to that and you can search and you can, you know, see the metadata along a timeline, yeah. which is really kind of turning out to be quite unique. I, I'm surprised that I, have, I, I don't see that at a lot of other places in sp specifically seeing the metadata along a timeline. And that's important because... The whole point, it's not just search. It's not just, I want to find assets where there's a guy wearing a green shirt with the Wasabi logo. I want to know where in that asset mm -hmm. those things appear because I'm an editor and I need to jump to those moments quickly. Right. 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 So that, that's, that's what we're doing at, at, um, at Wasabi with Wasabi Air. And that's, that's why Air stands for recognition, AI recognition, because, you know, we are essentially running AI against and recognizing objects, logos, faces, people, sounds. Yeah. Uh, for all your assets. So I want to dive into that. But before we do that, on the acquisition front, did Wasabi acquire a product from Gray Meta or did Wasabi acquire Gray Meta? Wasabi acquired the product, the Curio product. So Gray Meta can, is still exists. In fact, is really quite is thriving um, with the Iris product and the SAMA product, which okay. we talked about SAMA. Mm -hmm. a great, that was the other piece. I, I skipped over that too. When, I, when they called me and said, come be CEO of Gray Meta, it really made sense because Sama was part of that story. Mm. And that that was like a connection to my first job in tech, yeah. which was wonderful because I love I love the Sama product. Yeah. I mean, we were we were preserving the world's history, you know, the the National Archives and Library, uh, the US Library of Congress, the Shoah Foundation, the you know, cr criminal tribunal and the Rwandan genocide from the UN, like just history. So yeah. anyway, that, I digress. Well, no, I mean, actually the last step, as we sit here today and talk, the last episode that aired was with the uh, video Fortune, the Fortune Out Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies, which was, I think, one of the first, if not the first SAMA users. Uh, so uh, that, that definitely ties in. Um, but another point of intersection that we have is, is that around, I think it was 2015 NAB, maybe 2016 NAB, um, I remember wandering around the NAB floor and and for the past several months had been having conversations with Indiana University about this a concept of a project around you know this this they they had just digitized or actually were in the process of digitizing hundreds of thousands of hours of content video film mm -hmm. audio um, and they had the problem that they had to figure out metadata uh, for it you know they had some metadata uh, in some cases in other cases they didn't have any in other cases it wasn't dependable um, so we we were working on a project that was how does Indiana University and others tackle the challenge of uh, the generation of massive amounts of metadata that is meaningful, and so we that that was the spawning of this project, which became known as AMP. And and by the time this mm -hmm. episode air, airs, we will have aired an episode about AMP. But I I, I was wandering around the NAB floor. I come across Gray Meta. I was, as I remember, it was in like the back up against the wall, and uh, probably. And I'm like, oh my <laughs> god, this is the thing we've been talking about. Like it was kind of like this amazing realization that. Um, you know, other folks were doing great work on that front as well. I think at the same time, there was maybe 
perfect memory. I mean, they're they're one of the ones who I see doing metadata on the timeline in a, in a kind of a similar way that you're talking about. But um, but yeah, there weren't there weren't a lot of folks that were tackling that issue. So it's really cool one to have seen the evolution. So that, do I have that timeline right? Was it about like 2015? Was that you yes. had a product at that point? I remember seeing it. So like um, you had been working. Yeah, by on it. yeah so I jo- so we we I joined. I was, like I said, the second employee at Gray Meta, which would have been August of 2015. Okay. And so I guess that NAB would have been September, or, uh, April of 2016. 2016 right? Must have been, yep. Yes. And I, if I recall, we had a pretty, we, we did have a big booth and we had a product, but it's possible. I can't remember exactly when it is we introduced machine learning for the tagging. It's possible it was by then. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't right away. The, our, originally, we were just scraping exif and header data from files and 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 sort of putting a putting that in its own database which yeah it's, it's cool it's useful but when when machine learning came out holy cow i mean just speech to text alone yeah think of the searchability right now the problem was and i think this was definitely a problem in 2016 and really remained so uh for many years was that your only option was to use the machine learning as a service capabilities from the hyperscalers and they were great but they were very expensive yeah, yeah. Uh, and talk about like cost optimization you know we would even as testers we would get bills from from these cloud providers that that shocked us yeah after you know running it running the machine learning so we it's why we started machine box was because it, it just we just didn't think it had to be that that that, that was the only way to do it and and it was a problem. Like we were tr- having trouble getting customers yeah. because it was just too expensive. Um, that's all been solved now. But but that's why I think this is why it's interesting because the the it's really good validation that you guys that other people had come up with the same idea. That to me is a great sign. Whenever I see that, when independently different organizations and different people kind of come to the same conclusion that yeah, this is a problem. Yeah. We can solve it this way. But I think it's taken this long to do it in a way that's affordable, honestly, and secure. And also the accuracy has really improved yeah. since those early days Yeah. Um, to the point where it's like, actually, this, I can use this. This is a pretty, the transcripts in particular are sometimes 90 to 99 to a hundred percent accurate, yeah. um, even with weird accents and in different languages and all sorts. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. It's, 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 it's come a long way. Uh, to where it's it's production ready in many ways. Let me ask you though, from a different angle, from the from the customer angle, do you what are your thoughts on whether consumers are ready to put this level of sophistication uh, to use? What do you see out there? Do you see wide adoption? Are you struggling with that? What's that look like? So, do you mean you mean from the perspective of like, hey, I've got a Dropbox account or something, and I want to. I want to process it with AI. Well, I think there's. I think about it in a few ways. One is, are people prepared? And here, let's think about mm-hmm. logistics and technology. They have their files in a given place. They know what they know what they want to do. Um, they can provide access. They can do all those things. But the other is, um, kind of policy wise, uh, leveraging the outputs of 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 something like. Uh, Wasabi Air to be able to really put it to use in service of their mission and providing access, preservation, whatever those goals are. Um, uh, do you? That, I guess I'm wondering readiness on both those fronts. Do you, do you see that as a challenge, or do you find people are diving in whole hog here? What's that look like? I think I think people are diving in. I I, I think we've really reached the point now where, and it, I do think it's kind of it's a combination of the accuracy and the sort of cost to do it mm-hmm. because. If it's not very accurate um, and very expensive, that's a problem. If it's very accurate and very expensive, it's still a problem. But uh, but we're at a point now where we can do it inexpensively and and accurately. And so um, I, I'll mention that even just today, which which you know by the time folks listen to this, it'll probably be a few weeks in in the past now or so. But uh, Fortune magazine published a post about Wasabi Air and uh, the Liverpool Football Club. And they, what I, what I love is that they make it very clear, right? Their use case, which is we want our, the fans of the football club to be able to go onto an app and just watch highlights of, you know, Mohamed Salah crushing Man U, Mm -hmm. right? Manchester United. 
-hmm. and just get it like a quick 30 second compilation of like all the goals or whatever, you know, just, just fan engagement. Yeah. And, and in order to accomplish that, you know, Liverpool has unbelievable amounts of video content from every game from multiple cameras there. And, you know, they don't, they're, I think people imagine that there's there's like a whole bank of editors sitting around with nothing better to do. It's right. not really true. Right. They don't. They don't have that many editors. And these editors have to, you know, create content from all of this library and archive constantly. And th base, basically, Wasabi Air makes them do it so much faster mm. that they can actually have have a, an abundance of content ready for their app which helps with, with increases fan engagement and it's that simple for them and they like I, the the quote in the article from Drew Crisp um who is their senior vice president of their digital world um says that that's how that's how they think about applying AI you know we want to solve this use case we want to be able to create this 30 second compilation of all these goals um, maybe it's against a specific team or whatever the con whatever the context is, but we can't sit around for hours and hours and hours watching every single second and maybe manually logging things yeah. or tagging things or you know it's always like it's always a it always happens after the fact right yeah you've recorded it all okay now it's on a it's safe on it's on a disc I've got all my footage and then maybe you you know you in the file name you put the team you played. But that's not enough metadata, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So I, I think they are ready. I think you know, it's it's um people have to think about it the right way. You, you know, this is a productivity boost. Yeah. This yeah. is a time saving boost. This is a what hidden gems do I have in my archive? Yeah. Boost. Yeah. You know? that ladder that ladder use case, by the way, is is really spectacular, but very hard to put a number to and hard to measure. You know, how much money do I make from? the hidden gems, yeah. the things that I didn't even know I had in the first place. And I, and sports organizations are interesting. They've always kind of been at the leading edge, I think, when it comes to um, creation and utilization of metadata in service of analytics, statistics, fan experience. I mean, we think about Major League Baseball was always doing great stuff. NBA has done some great stuff. I mean, it's... And, and they have something going for them, which is a, a certain amount of consistency, right? There's a structure to the game that allows, there's there's known names and entities and things. So, um, so that does make a lot of sense. And it seems like it's just ripe uh, for, for really making the most of something like Wasabi Air. I can just see that being a huge uh, benefit to, to organizations like that. Um, are, are you seeing, can you give us some examples? Are there other um maybe non-sports organizations that are that are use cases that are using uh, Wasabi Air? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'll give you one more sports one first, though, because th there, there's, you know, the, the use case I gave you is is about creating content and marketing content for channels and for consumption of, of consumers. But they also are, you know, especially teams, individual teams are very brand heavy in the sense that they, you know, they seek sponsorship for logo placement in the field or the stadium or whatever. And air is used for by sports teams to look at that data and basically roll up, hey, the Wasabi logo appeared in 7% of this game yeah. and the Nike logo appeared in 4% of this game. And then you can go to Nike and say, hey, do you want to be 7%? You should buy this logo st stanchion or mm. whatever. You mm. know? So really interesting use cases there, but yeah. non-sports use cases. So one of my all-time favorites is a, uh, a company called uh, video fashion and video fashion has a very large library. I think it's on the, to the tune of 30,000 hours of video footage of the fashion industry going back as long as video can go back. And they, um, and, and a lot of this was on videotape and needed to be digitized. And I mm. think they still have a lot that still needs to be digitized, but they used Wasabi air back when it was called Curio. Um, basically to kind of, you know, auto tag and catalog these things so that when they get a request for, and they license this footage, right? Mm. So this is how they make money. This is how they monetize it. This is why I like this use case, because it's a very clear cut monetization use case where they sell the, you know, li they license this footage per, I want to say per second, probably. Mm -hmm. And they, and so Apple TV plus came to them one day, as just an example and said, 
hey, we're making a documentary. It's called Supermodels. Do you have any footage of Naomi Campbell mm. in the 90s? It took them like five seconds, right. right? To bust out every single piece of content they have where not only does Naomi Campbell appear, but her name is written across the street. Somebody talks about her, right? So it, it and it's literally like a couple seconds. Yeah. That, that, and then they just they license it, right? So they they get all this revenue and have very little cost yeah. associated with servicing that revenue. And that's exactly the kind of thing we want Wasabi Air to empower. You know, it's time is money, my friend. Yeah, you know, well, saving, saving time. I love one of the things I really like about Wasabi Air is that it allows you to do sophisticated search where you can say, I want to see Naomi Campbell. I want it in this geographic location. I want it at this facility and wearing this color of clothing or something, right? Like you can put together these really sophisticated searches and come up with the results that match that, which I think is just fantastic. I think that is that is the realization of what the ideal vision is for being able to search through audiovisual content in the same way that we search through Word documents and PDFs today. I mean, that's 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 fantastic. I'd love to dig into like. Let's dig. Let's make this a little bit more concrete for people. We haven't really talked about exactly what it is. We got this high level description, um, but let's jump in a little bit more. So, so folks that are going to use Wasabi Air would be clients that store their assets in Wasabi in Wasabi storage. Is that a true statement? Yes, they okay. they can be existing customers or you know new customers. Um, but yes, so you, you've got, you need you need to put your stuff in Wasabi storage. So you've got your assets in Wasabi storage. How do you turn Wasabi Air on? Is it something that's in the admin panel? How does that work? Uh, not yet. Okay. Uh, I, th I mean, that is, that's where we're working towards. Right now, you reach out to us. Okay. Um, you, you know, reach out to your sales representative or, you know, honestly, on our website, I think we've got a submission form. You say, I'm interested. This is how much content I have. Um, and you don't have to be a Wasabi customer when you reach out, right? Like, we'll, we'll, we'll help you sort that, sort that out. But uh, essentially, when we we'll we'll just we'll create an instance for you of Wasabi Air, and when we do that, we'll um, attach your buckets in, from your Wasabi account, and it'll start processing. And basically, you'll get an email or you know probably an email with a, a URL and credentials to log in. And when you click on that URL and log in, you'll have a user interface um, that looks a lot like Google, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's there's you know some buttons and things on the side but essentially right in the center is just a search bar mm -hmm. and we want it to be int intuitive of course obviously happy to answer questions from folks but you should be able to just start searching you know we'll, we'll be processing in the background and maybe you want to wait for it to complete processing it's up to you but you can just start searching and you'll get results and those results will sort of tell you um you know some some basic metadata about each one there'll be a little thumbnail and then let's say you search for the word wasabi and, and maybe you specified just logos. I just want where the logo is a wasabi, not the word or somebody saying wasabi. When you get the search results, let's say you, you click on the first one, you'll have a, a little preview window and you can play, play the asset if it's a video or audio file, right? We have a nice little you know proxy in the browser. And then you're going to see all this metadata that's all timeline time code accurate along the side and you can kind of toggle between looking at the speech to text or looking at the um, object tags and then on the bottom will be a timeline kind of like a nonlinear editor It'll be this long timeline and your search term wasabi for the logo you'll see all these little like kind of tick marks where it found that logo so you could just click a button and jump right to that moment and what I like about that is, so let's say, let's say in the use case, you're trying to, you're trying to quickly scan through some titles for bad words or for uh, nudity or violence or something like that. Those, you know, those things will show up and you can just in five seconds, you can just, you know, make, go through them and make sure they're either okay or not. Right. Like sometimes, for example, it'll, you know, it, it, it'll give you a false positive. That's just what happens with machine learning, but it, it doesn't take you very long. In fact, it takes you almost no time at all to just clear it and just you know go through. And then if you want, you can even edit it and just remove it or add a tag or something. So let's um so hopefully that gives a good picture. Yeah. So um well and I'll ask this question uh because Wasabi is so transparent about pricing. You mentioned six ninety nine per terabyte. Is there is there transparency on that level yet with air or is this still something that's in motion or yeah, we're still we're still working on it, but we do have a kind of a we we came out with a pricing for NAB. We're calling it the NAB Show Special, 
Um, so, you know, to get, get it while it's hot, I guess, uh, <laughs> because we probably will have to change it, but, um, it's just 1299 a terabyte okay. per month. Okay. So think of it almost like a, a different tier of storage, although, you know, it's, it's the same storage. It's just that you have now all this indexed metadata. And so, is that twelve ninety nine per month on top of the six ninety nine per month, or is that inclusive of so twelve ninety nine total? Inclusive. Exactly. So yeah, which is still cheaper than I think the twenty or thirty bucks per terabyte per month for just the storage for some of the hyperscalers. So, right. you know, right. even even if you didn't use Air and you were just paying for the storage, it's still a lot a lot less expensive, and there's no egress and no API fees and all that. Yeah. So in the I, I mentioned the project that I was working on before called AMP. We we call we came up with the term MGMs, which stands for metadata generation mechanisms. And this is to say speech to text or object recognition or facial recognition. Right. Those would all be things we called MGMs, right? Do you have a term for those? What do you call those? Just so I can refer to we them. Call, do. So this is so funny you ask because when we we when we started Gray Meta, we had so much fun trying to come up with that term and. The original product was called Haystack because we thought you're going to find the needles in <laughs> I a like haystack, that. That's right? That's great. I like that. Yes. So so how do you find a needle in a haystack? Bring a big old magnet. Mm -hmm. So we called those things magnets at first. Um, oh, that's you know, cool. You'd have a, a magnet for speech to text or whatever. Um, I, I, think, I think they were still called magnets by the time I left. When I came back, we were calling them harvesters, which uh, – or maybe, gosh – extractors maybe extractors okay so um but but since we joined wasabi i think we've just been referring to them as models honestly models In okay the, not all of them are machine learning models but you know okay well i just different. just so we have a term to for this discussion i'll use the term models then to talk about that so so can you tell us what models you have built into air right now yes so right now um we have speech to text which is uh outstanding and understands, I think, 50 languages and will translate it even to English, um, as well as do a transcription in the native language. We have an audio classification engine, which, you know, basically tries to g tell you what sounds it hears, you know, coughing, screaming, gunshot, blah, blah, blah. Hmm. We have a logo and brand detection system, which we just trained ourselves from scratch and is um, very good. Actually, I'm really surprised because that, that's that was when we were doing this before, that was a really hard problem to solve. It still is, but we, we actually got it working. Then we have an object recognition model, which will essentially try to tag things it sees, lamp, post, shirt, beard, that kind of thing. Um, and then we've got um, OCR, optical character recognition. So words that appear on the screen get turned into metadata. And then we've, we've got, we call it... Um, we call it uh, technical cues. So this is very specific to the M and E industry, but mm. bars and tone, slate, Got titles, it. that sort of thing, and then faces and people. So you know we will we will detect faces, and then kind of kind of like how in iPhotos, um, you on your phone, like it'll it'll say who's this, right? Here's a bunch of photos of this person. Who is this? Same thing, right? We, we group unknown faces together. You can type in who they are. And then going forward, you've, you basically have names associated with, with faces right. uh, in your system. And, and if I remember right from the demo, you can also upload images of uh, individuals that you know are going to be in your collection and, uh, and identify proactively, right? Like I, if for myself, yes. if I could, I could upload three photos of myself, say, this is Chris Lucinic, and then it'll use that to, to, you can do tag. it ahead of time. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so cool. if you know the people ahead of time, you can do it too, which is, which is really useful. <clears throat> I like that feature. I mean, that's another thing that is similar with AMP is just the, the concept of, um, using non audiovisual materials in order to train models on, to describe audiovisual objects. So, yes. um, the okay, that's great. And do you do you um, are those all are all of those models uh, things that Wasabi has built that are owned by Wasabi, or are you connecting to other um, providers of we, AI services? We built we built all our own models, all homegrown. Okay, this was the this was my this was my big change when I came back to Gray Meta. Um, it, it because I had experience doing it, I knew it was possible, and I didn't think that relying on third party models was a good idea. I mean, 
obviously for intellectual property reasons, but also it's just really expensive to do it yeah. that way. We wanted to make it just basically, I don't want to, I don't want to say cheap, but we wanted to make it economical for people, mm-hmm. right? We, because that was a major barrier. If you are, you know, uh, a, a large library, you could have millions of hours of footage. And if you're paying the hyperscalers, which charge like 50 bucks an hour in some case, I mean, what are you going to spend $120 million on, right. on AI tagging? Probably not. So, um, uh, so we built all our own and the reason we were able to do that. And by the way, like, don't think you can just go on to hugging face and pull down a model off the shelf and just pop it into production. Right. I have seen that you can't do that. And, and the reason is because, you know, a lot of those models are trained on not media and entertainment. They're mm. trained on other world things and they don't work. They don't, their, their accuracy drops when you're talking to people like LFC or you're talking to, to, you know, um, you know, pick, pick your, pick your broadcaster, pick your network, pick your, po- pick your post house. When you're talking about media and entertainment content, um, they need to be trained for that. And then you got to build in pipelines and we had to do all kinds of stuff to make it efficient because, mm. There's a lot of really cool machine learning out there that, that's very advanced, but very expensive and compute intensive to run. And that's also not going to work for customers. They can't spend 50 bucks an hour on their machine learning tagging. Right. Like it's not, it's a no-go. So we've put, a, we've put years of experience into our models and, and also understanding like what to expect on the other end. I, there, there's a, there's a guy who works for me, Jesse Graham. He's been doing this for so long that you can give him any machine learning model now, and he can just he he know he knows the the pieces of content that's going to throw it for a loop, and he can see the results, and he knows customers are going to either be okay with this or not. Yeah, and that that experience is so valuable to us because it gives it lets us quickly iterate, it lets us go to market with with production models that actually work for customers. They're not just cool demos, you know. They're not just um, kind of fluffy, fun things. They're real. They they yeah. have real value, and that. That's why we, we spend so much time building our own models. Do you have feedback or requests for the Damn Right podcast? Hit me up and let me know at damnright at weareavp.com. Looking for amazing and free resources to help you on your damn journey? Let the best damn consultants in the business help you out. Visit weareavp.com slash free hyphen resources. And finally, stay up to date with the latest and greatest from me and the Damn Right Podcast by following me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash in slash C Lucinic. And let me ask, related to that, talking about training it based on media and entertainment and broadcast content, how how have you found it to work or have you done testing on archival content stuff that's not production, you know, necessarily like production broadcast quality, always highly variable, maybe lower quality audio and video stuff like how 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 is it performing on that sort of content uh, surprisingly well actually um i'll give you an example so steamboat willie which is now in the public domain um a, you know a practically an ancient piece of animated content featuring i think the original appearance of mickey mouse although i don't think he was called mickey mouse back then um anyway there there's it it, it correctly identifies the boat as a boat um you know, it, 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 the object recognition surprisingly is able to tag things that are animated and in black mm-hmm. and white. Um, I have, I have also seen it pick up logos that are un, almost undetectable by human eyes. Mm-hmm. So, um, I, we, I had, I had so much fun showing this off at NAB because I, we, uh, Wasabi sponsored the Fenway Bowl, uh, recently. And so we had, we had the, the Fenway Bowl and we ran, we ran it against Wasabi Air and there's obviously a ton of logos everywhere. And so um, there was this one logo, golf, I think it was golf oil or something like that. And uh, I would show, so I'd pull it up on the screen and I would click and jump to that moment. And I would say, okay, everybody who's watching me do this demo right now, tell me when you see the golf oil logo mm. in the video. And they're like squinting. And, you know, most people don't see it, but if you kind of expand it and zoom in, it's just there, teeny tiny little thing in the background. So yeah. Um, I've, I've been, I've been really pleased with a lot of, of where machine learning has, has, how, how far it's come in terms of the research that's gone on behind it. The, you know, the, the embeddings and weights that you, that people are open sourcing and making available. It's, it's, it's just extraordinary. 
Yeah. Let me dive into the weeds a little bit here about uh, kind of the, the, the models and things. Um, I'm curious. I mean, one of the things that we developed in AMP, and I'm wondering, I know that you had to have thought about this, um, and I'm curious where, where you've arrived and what you're thinking about for future, but is the concept of workflows. It, sound, it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong once I'm done saying this, that like, I, I have my I have my videos and my audio and things stored in in Wasabi. I turn on Wasabi Air, and it runs these models. It sounded like seven or eight ish models, um, I think in parallel. But let's say that I wanted to create a something that um, uh, does speech to text and then runs it through named entity recognition, sentiment analysis, right? I take and I, so I want to take outputs of one model, plug it into another model. Uh, and create workflows instead of just getting the output of a single model. W where are you yeah. at? Does that exist today? Is that on the horizon? What's that yeah. look like? Yeah. So um, I, I've experimented with that in some way or another at actually several different companies. Um, in fact, I think at Veritone, we even had like a workflow builder that you could do where you could sort of drag nodes in and go output from this to there. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the state, what we, I think the way that we're thinking about it today is we just, we don't want you to even have to do that, right? So let's 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 pick apart why you're doing that. Mm -hmm. So named entity recognition based on speech to text. It's a really good example, right? Like I want maybe uh, I want to search by places. So speech to text, it's particularly the one that we've we've developed, um, is f surprisingly good, is shockingly good at proper nouns and proper names for things, right? This is where speech to text in the past has always fell down, right? Um, and, and, but it's just text. So what the way we think about it is instead of, instead of you having to come up with that use case or that workflow, we're just going to build that in. So you, you so you, you, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're a product, when you're running product, right. And you're thinking about, okay, how do I solve these problems? You know, I like to, I like, and this is a great thing I learned from, from working at Amazon is this, is just put yourself in the customer's shoes, be customer obsessed. Think about, okay, the editor's sitting down, they got to do their job. They want to, you know, get shots of um, the Eiffel Tower or something, or, or or maybe just, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a better example of that, because if you searched for Eiffel Tower, you would just show up. But, um, you know, named entity recognition is like companies or something like that. Maybe I'm looking for people, okay, I got it. When people are talking about Wasabi the company and not wasabi the sushi sauce, right? Mm -hmm. right, right I want right. to differentiate. So normally, I if I search for the word wasabi, obviously it, all references will show up. Um, we we are going to we are going to give you an experience where that is just seamless, right? That it's a new option. Just search for wasabi the company, or you know, I'm doing I'm doing named entity recognition. Uh, on on the speech to text, we may that's how we might solve it in the back end. We may we may solve it some other way. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of the whole machine learning pipeline thing is what's really evolving. Um, like for example, our audio classification and speech to text are 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 one multi multimodal model. For example, so there's there's this kind of newer world of these end to end neural networks that are um, really good at doing different things. You know, in, instead of instead of in the old way, which is what you described, where we would kind of have the output of one and go and make it be input in another, that kind of ends up being like a Xerox of a Xerox of a Xerox sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so we we are we're building kind of uh, more capabilities around combining these things into one neural network, so that you know, a it's way more efficient, and b it's it's more accurate. So that you're going to see from us, you know, in the coming months, a lot of innovations around that and. With the express goal of doing what you described, which is just better search, yeah, better, more contextual, more accurate search. Well, I have to hand it to you. I mean, I think you know what you what you uh, gain with sophistication. You kind of add a, a burden of complexity. And right now, I've seen the demo of Wasabi Air, and it is uh, elegant in its simplicity. So I can totally understand aiming for simplicity. That's going to be a better user experience. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. I, it'd be good to maybe, uh, I don't want to bore our listeners with that, maybe a sidebar sometime offline. We can talk about that. Uh, Absolutely. And one another question in the weeds here. Uh, I mean, one of the things that that 
that I've grappled with or we grappled with in the AMP project that I'd, I'd love to know what you're thinking about or how you're managing this, uh, if you're able to share, is like, you know, the, the in the in on the efficiency front of, of processing efficiency, right? Like the concept of running, for instance, speech to text where there's nobody talking, it's music or, or BPM yeah. analysis on music where there's somebody talking, right? Like facial recognition where there aren't people, uh, you got the idea here, like, but, but trying to really like only feed segments of relative things to uh, models uh, using your term um, in order to uh, create more efficient and cost-effective processing. Is that, is that just, is that so negligible? Is, it, is that so processor intensive that it doesn't really pay off? Or is that an actual model that I'm now using model th- in a different way that works? I know what you mean. Yeah, I, I think it does add up. So, you know, in the true FinOps cost optimization fashion, uh, you know, once you take out the big things, you go after the little things because they do, they just add up, right? If I can reduce some fee that's one cent or something to half a cent, that in theory would add up. So it's worth it to think about it. Um, you know, we do have some of that. So for example, you mentioned a really good example of that, which is don't run speech to text if there's nobody talking. So we actually have a separate model that um, we call, uh, I think it's called the voice activity detector or something like that. So this is what I mean. Like this is, this is such a good, it's such a good example of what I was trying to convey, which is that you have to think about these things when you're doing this in production and you, and, and these are the things that drive efficiency to make it actually viable for customers to pay for and use. Yeah. So we, when we were, when we first started building our own speech to text, you know, we just, you know, p- plopped it in, um, you know, we, we, we ran it and my goodness, it was so slow and the accuracy was great, but it just was not going to work. Over time, we build the pipeline better. It, we introduced VAD. That greatly improved the accuracy of the time code markers for the speech to text, mm. as well as improved the overall efficiency. I mean, I, I don't want to get in trouble for this, but I think we we like improved the efficiency by a hundred times. Think about that. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's that's a huge huge difference, yeah. and that's that's just basically trial by fire in some ways. I mean. I believe in iterative product design. You know, I don't. I don't like to sit around for six months and try to build the perfect product. I like to build little things and iterate quickly and mm-hmm. learn. And you know, that was one of the first things that that, that we we learned when we first started doing speech to text. And we just iterated it and made it faster, faster, and faster until we got to this super efficient state. Yeah. So um, yeah, in for for an in the weeds question, that that was a really poignant one because it it is where I think the value of air comes from, and and perhaps you know, other systems that are trying to accomplish the same thing is you, you, when you build your own machine learning, there's a lot of things you got to think about and it's hard to know what they're going to be up front. And you, you t- it t- it's taken us years to get it right. Now it doesn't necessarily mean it'll take everybody years. So you can always learn, but it's a trial by fire. <laughs> it, it makes me think of formula one racing with hundreds of little tweaks to these vehicles to make things just get yes. a 10th of a second faster or something. Right. Um, let me jump over to the questions around ethics and AI. Um, and I'm going to break that into a couple categories to, to kind of uh, go off of here. I guess, you know, when it's come up, typically there's one around bias, the how do the AI models in this way perform across a variety of contexts. Um, uh, another is around intellectual property. Like, um, you know, here we think of, in in chat gpt now i can get i can buy the business license in which i'm not uh my content that i'm feeding it is not going to train the the model right as opposed to the free or the cheap one where my data that i feed it goes to train the larger model um can you talk about how you are thinking about and acting on those sorts of ethical questions today absolutely um you know this it, it for me machine learning is not a means to an end. So I kind of like to, I kind of like to use the, the, um, the analogy that, you know, you like, I don't, I don't, I don't go around talking about how Wasabi Air is built on electricity, right? Like that's, that doesn't make sense. Electricity is, is a technology that we kind of take for granted. Machine learning solves the real problem that I'm trying to solve, which is I don't want people to have to lose content 
in their archives. I want people to be able to find stuff quickly and be able to get it out the door. And I want editors to just have a wonderful life, <laughs> not be miserable. Um, and so, and so I, I think about machine learning in that sense. I don't think about it as a, Hey, we're going to try and scrape as much data and make the best, you know, overall models and make money with, by selling machine learning, if, if that makes sense. So, you know, I think, I think your motivations for, for your ethical use of AI start there. Um, the inter the bias thing is really interesting and I have to hand it to, I mentioned my machine box co-founders before Matt Ryer and David Hernandez, David Hernandez, um, brilliant computer scientist. He, he really taught me a lot. And one of the things that he pointed out to me was, and this was back in, you know, we were doing machine box in, I don't know, 2017 or 2018 was that, uh, there, there are systems out there that turn words into vectors. And this is important because for the, for the listeners who don't know what that means, um, basically take the word frog and take the word toad. Now, instinctually as humans, we know that those are a lot closer together in concept than the word frog and the word uh, curiosity. So vectors attempt to kind of do the same thing. We take basically every word, and this is, you know, you, you have to picture a thousand dimensions, right? You can't, it's not a three-dimensional thing. It's like thousands of dimensions, yeah. But basically, in these thousands of dimensions, we can do math to figure out that the word frog and the word toad are very close together. And this, this helps us like in search. So if I search for toad, I get pictures of frogs because they're they're very relevant. Now, that those systems, you know, a lot of these embedding and vectorization systems were trained, um, at least back in the day, and I'm, I, I'm pretty sure this has been addressed, but they were trained on news articles and written material from humanity. Go, ranging all the way back. The, so, so what happened was that if you if you actually look at the distance between, for example, the word doctor and the word man, much closer than doctor and woman, and the inverse was true for nurse and man and nurse and woman. Now, you know that's a bias. That bias came from the training data, mm. which is again, I think, was a lot of news articles written over the last seventy years or something like that. So, you know, what you end up with is a machine learning system that's just as biased as humans are or have been in the past, and they don't necessarily reflect, um, you know, our, our inclusive nature and how we, how we want our society to exist, where we don't want that bias, right? That's, that's not something we want in our machine learning because we're using our machine learning to solve problems in the real world, and it doesn't reflect the real world. So I think about that a lot, and I think about, you know, how can we improve our machine learning. Now it is, it's the training data. It's not the machine learning models. It's the training data. So yeah. we as humans have to go back and fix that in the training data and do our best to, you know, think of those things ahead of time. And there's ways, there's tools to like process your training data in certain ways and look at patterns and things like that. And, and you can, you can detect that kind of thing. Um, so I'm always thinking about that and I, I always want to make it better. And it's probably an ongoing challenge that's never going to really end, um, you know, but, but something that we have to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Ethically, I, you know, like any technology, any new technology, you know, you, this, this, what I'm about to say could be applied to uh, nuclear physics. It could be applied to electricity. It could be applied to, you know, taking metal and making it sharper. Don't use it for bad things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, you know, your, your, your intentions, like I mentioned before, my intention is to make people's lives uh, at, at, their, at their jobs, in particular, media and entertainment editors and, and marketing people and these professionals, I don't want them to have to sit around trying to find stuff. I want to make them immediately find the thing they're looking for and deliver the, the content and the value that they want. That, that's my purpose. Yeah. If your purpose is to go around electrocuting people or dropping nuclear bombs or stabbing people, you're going to use these technologies in, 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 in the wrong way. So I don't, I don't mean that, I don't mean to say that like we, we all have to just be responsible for our own actions. I think we do, but, but the rules that we come up with, you know, scientists have rules around bioengineering, for example. Um, you know, there's laws against, you can't patent certain, you know, molecules, you can't patent DNA. Um, and those things are being challenged all the time. I do think that we can collectively as a society agree that we're not going to use AI for these purposes, even though 
some people will, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can't legislate bad guys out of existence. They, they will be there and they will, they will test it. But I think the more educated we are about it, the more we can tackle it. But I don't think that means we have to stop using AI or ML or we can't innovate and we shouldn't innovate and we shouldn't see where this can go. I think that's equally as dangerous. I've got a question that's a little bit out there, but it, if you don't, if you don't have a response to this, I don't know anybody who does. So uh, uh, you're you're the best person I can think of to ask this question, um, and that is about a pro uh, the prospect of a future in which um, the the machine learning models, and here I'm not talking about models as in things that generate metadata, but the machine learning model as in the thing that you train um, over time. Um, are interoperable. Um, I mean, is there is there a future in which I go to Wasabi as an organization? I, tr I my data is there. Um, I I uh, I spend years training it and cultivating that data. Uh, not just the data, not the output of just the metadata, but um, let's say uh, the machine learning um, that we do over time and training the models and, and giving it feedback and and maybe triangulation of that data. Um, that, uh, you know, God forbid, Wasabi goes out of business in 20 years, that I could take that and, and transfer it to, you know, another entity that has machine learning. Is there, is there a future in which such a, a, a thing exists or is, is that not even on the horizon? Well, <clears throat> you know, today, um, you know, we, we, we want, I'm, I'm a very customer obsessed person. I mentioned that already. And I think if I'm the customer, I when I spend effort and time training a machine learning model, let's say in Wasabi Air, which you can do, you can train it on people and soon you'll be able to train it on, on other things. I'm putting my effort and my data into that. I should own that. And I believe in that, right? So we we segment that all off. Like Wasabi doesn't, we don't aggregate people's data. We don't look at the training data and make our own models better. We You own it, it's your data. If you trained it, it's yours. Um, and, and, but, you know, I, I think that, I think that it would be hard, just the nature of the technology itself, it's hard to take all that training and, and shuffle it off somewhere else. I mean, I guess in theory, there's like embeddings and vectors and stuff like that. And you could, you could, I think more likely, um, over time, you won't have to train it. Um, I think our models will get better at context. They will be larger. They'll have more parameters, mm -hmm. but, um, I also think that, you know, they'll get more specific and be, and, and I kind of like this agent approach that's kind of emerging where, you know, l let me put it this way. I do not think that artificial general intelligence is anywhere near happening. You know, I, I, I mean, I think, I think people will change their definition of what that means to kind of fit their predictions, but I don't think that we're in danger of one very large AI model that just does everything and takes over humanity and kills us all. Uh, or, you know, I don't know, who knows, maybe they'll do something wonderful, like, you know, help us explore other planets, whatever. Um, I think what's more likely is that we will get better at segmenting off specific tasks and making machine learning models that are just very, very, very good at that. And then orchestrating that, mm -hmm. which is kind of what Wasabi Air does today. But, um, I, I I don't I don't think like the need for training it is interesting because you know if you asked me this question back in 2017 again David Hernandez taught me another really important thing about machine learning which is that your machine learning model should be trained on the data that it's expected to run against you should not be able to tell the difference and this this was kind of at the time when like synthetic training data was emerging and and it just it just you can't beat a human curated, really, really clean, really good data set. Like mm. you can't beat it. Um, and, and today I think that, you know, that might be changing a little bit hmm. and that the need to train models, um, to be more specific or, 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 or to train it on your own data is, is, yeah, not, not heading up. I think it's probably going down. In fact, we already see some of it a little bit like, um, you know, our, our like, Take, okay, great example, the Steamboat Willie example. It used to be that you would have to train your object recognition system to recognize animated 
objects as kind of mm. custom objects. Um, we have been experimenting with some machine learning that we, we haven't put into air yet, but we might at some point where, uh, you don't have to do that anymore. In fact, it actually interprets your, your search in a different way. So I could, so if I searched for, um, I, I, let, let me put it this way. Like it would process a picture. Let's say it takes a picture of the two of us talking and I have a beard and you don't have a beard. And I, and I, and I sent it to this system and processed it instead of coming back with brown hair, beard, blue shirts, microphone, right? This whole list of things. Mm -hmm. It just, it just, it just sits there. Then you ask it, is there a microphone in this picture? Yes, there is. Here it is. Is there, and, and you can, and this is what I like about it because the words that we use can be, can be very different. So is there a mustache? Yes, there's a mustache and it draws a line just around this part of my beard. Instead of saying the whole thing is a beard, mm -hmm. right? Um, or, you know, you, you, it's, it's using an LLM to interpret the question rather than trying to uh, seek custom training. And it has a fundamental deep understanding of the picture in a way that we don't understand as humans, right? It's broken it down into vectors and, and, mm -hmm. and things that, that, that are, that's just basically math. And when you ask it, does it, does, is there a green shirt here? It interprets your question and goes, okay, this vector over here kind of looks like a green shirt. I'm going to say there's a 60% chance that that's what it is and draw a bounding box around it. And there you go. Mm -hmm. I think that's the future. I think that's where we're going is yeah. machine learning models that are specific, but way more contextual and understand images and video and data in ways that we can't, but can but uh, but can be mapped to concepts that we as humans think about. Yeah, yeah. And somewhat related, kind of pulling several of these strings together, uh, like the question around humans in the loop, like we've done a lot of work with the Library of Congress and Indiana University, that AMP project kind of had at its core that, like humans in the loop as far as these workflows go. And some of that was quantitative. It was about, um, you know, for instance, taking the the output in a given workflow, taking the output of speech to text, reviewing it by a human, editing, correcting, and then feeding it back sort of thing. Some of it's qualitative. Right. It's about ethics. Um, you know, there's some sensitive collections that need to be reviewed uh, and make sure that they're, that they're described uh, properly and, and, and accordingly and things. Um, and I, you know, I guess I wonder, do you think about that um, in the work that you're doing? One, it sounds like some of what you just said makes it sound like the quantitative aspect of that is becoming less and less important as things improve dramatically. Um, but I wonder, do you think about humans in the loop with regard to what, so what, what Wasabi offers? Or do you think about that as something that's up to the user, you know, post Wasabi processing to manage themselves? No, I think about it all the time. In fact, you know, one of one of the one of the bigger initiatives that we have, and and we are still working on it very much, is a a frictionless human in the loop process mm -hmm. with your data. So, you know, in spite of what I just said, I still think that you need to be able to teach it things based on your data um, and correct it, and it should learn. Um, we do that with faces today, for example, right? Like that. That's that. That's a really good example of this, but it's solved. Where we want to take it is some of the other things you mentioned. So, um, you know, improving proper noun and proper name detection, um, improving, you know, the way it detects certain objects and things in your data, because, you know, maybe you're, um, you're NASCAR or something, and you just have a very specific content with, with, with objects that are, you know, in the broader perspective, kind of strange, but in your perspective are very set and, in, and, in, this is usually the same or something like that. Like we should be, you should be able to use your own data and say, yeah, that that's what this is. This mm -hmm. is a tire. This is a, this car. Um, and we, we actually do have it in the system. We've just disabled it for now because we, we want to, I want to make it so seamless that you, that you, you don't even really know what you're, you're, you don't even really think about it as a way as training machine learning, just like I, I really love the Apple photos example. They, they just do such a good job with faces. Like, you, I mean, I'm sure, I don't know if you have an iPhone. I'm sure Android does, does the same thing. You're just mm -hmm. going your photos and it's like, hey, by, you know, who, who is this guy? Who, who is that, right? Brilliant. Like, it should be very similar. What, you know, what is this? I don't know what this is. Tell me what this is. So I think about that a lot. Um, and I definitely, you know, I definitely see th there, there, there is just no better arbiter for 
accuracy in machine learning and data sets than humans, um, ironically, you know, and, uh, and, and y- you have to, as a human, make some decisions. So I, so for example, uh, back in 2016 or so, I thought, you know what, I bet I could train a classification engine to tell if a cert- if a news article was fake news or not fake news, right? This fake news was a big problem in 2016. Um, and so I went about to try and train it. And basically that meant creating a data set of fake news and not fake news. I, I wrote a, a lengthy blog post about the details, so I won't, I won't reiterate it here, but, um, but the, 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 what ended up, what I ended up figuring out was that as a human, I have to decide what, what is fake news? Like, how do I, is it satire? Is it, you know, factually incorrect information? Is it, there's like kind of all of these like subcategories mm-hmm. and I just had to figure out where do I draw the line and where I ended up where the machine learning ended up working best was when I drew the line in the data set at bias. So what I was really doing was training a bias detection system. Mm. So, you know, it was able to tell if this article was written in a biased way or an unbiased way and kind of rank it. Um, and so, you know, that, that journey for me was, was really telling yeah. about how data sets get made to train these machine learning systems in the first place. You can't, you you really you really cannot mess up. Yeah. Like if you're and this is where the human in the loop problem uh, or question can become a problem and you have to think about like if I am surfacing, hey, what is this logo and you get it wrong and the next guy gets it right five times, you you've you've caused a problem in your machine learning, mm. right? Because you now have a dirty data set. Yeah. So you need to think about that like how do I keep it clean? How do I check that you know this work that's been done is actually accurate, and so that's part of the reason why we're we're spending so much time thinking about it. Is we want to get that experience right. Yeah, so that's on the horizon. It sounds like um, that's yeah. great. Look forward to seeing that. Um, and users of Wasabi Air, uh, you you have a as we mentioned a, a user interface within um, Wasabi's uh, GUI, but uh, is there uh, APIs that can push this out to other systems? Uh, if people generate the metadata in Wasabi Air, can they push it to their dam? Or absolutely. In fact, we're doing we're we're um, we're making we're we're in the talks with several MAM systems right now to uh, and if, I think that IBC will will which is in September will be able to announce some of them. But um, we, we we want we want people to do that right. The, the 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 vision for for Wasabi Air and for Curio prior to the acquisition was always that this is a sort of data platform with with APIs. In fact, our whole UI is it consumes our own APIs, um, and that was really important for us. And that that was um, you know a wise decision that was made before I came back to Gray Meta because yeah. you you know at the end of the day, like our you know this in, in the Dam world and the Mam world in particular, man, you can go in a lot of directions with a Mam. You can you can get bogged down in the tiny features and all of the requests that customers want, and I think that's why so many MAMs today are kind of uh, like rubber band balls. They have a lot of features, and they're all different, and they all have different buttons, and they can be very confusing. It's really hard to keep something simple when you're sort of serving all of those use cases and trying to build a thousand features, one for each customer. Yeah, I don't want to be in that business. So you know, I, I think we've got a great tool that gets you what you need off the ground right away. You know, somebody, some customers have described it as a great C-level tool as well. Like we just, we just need some insight into this archive for our, for our managers or for these certain groups of people, but the Mm -hmm. people who use MAMs and MAMs and really use them, they should have access to the metadata too. And so they will. Well, let's talk. I think what I see when I look at Wasabi Air is a blurring of the lines between what has been storage and dam and ma'am, but also between, you know, storage uh, and and other storage providers that offer AI and ML tools, right? So I'd like to, let's touch on each of those for a minute. Um, Wasabi Air brings to the table something that is in many ways not new, right? Uh, Google Cloud and, and AWS, they have a suite of tools that you can use to process your materials. But it is new that you turn on the switch and it does it automatically. You don't have to go deploy this tool and that tool and put together workflows and things like that. Um, is that the main difference between, you know, is that how you would describe the difference between what Wasabi's doing today and what AWS is doing today? Absolutely. 
Yes. I mean, I, I, I feel like I don't even need to continue talking, but I will, uh, <laughs> because I think you described it pretty perfectly. Like you, you, you we, you know, we want it to be very simple and elegant and we kind of want to redefine what object storage is. Mm. Uh, what is especially cloud object storage? Like what is the, what, what, what criteria defines cloud object storage and having a metadata and an index that's searchable, I think is we're hoping is, is going to be the new definition because it, it is really hard to solve this other ways. I mean, there are other similar tools, but yeah, if you use the hyperscalers, um, first of all, it's an API call. You got to, st you still have to process your video, transcode it. And in some cases, chop it up, post post each of those pieces, or in other cases, you can send the whole file, but I think it depends, to an API endpoint, get back that metadata, and then what, right? Like it's a JSON file. Um, and then, so if you want to view this metadata on a timeline and make it searchable, there's a whole stack you need to build with, with open search or some kind of search index incorporated. You need to build a UI. You know, you have to process and collate all that metadata. You have to keep track of where it came from. Yeah. Especially if you're chopping stuff up into segments. Um, and yeah, it just, it ends up, you end up building a MAM. It's and, complicated. And, or some, yeah, it's complicated. Exactly. So I, I do, I do think that, you know, the value of just being able to just turn it on, like here's yeah. my storage, press a button. And now I've got this, you know, insight. And if I want, I can hit the API, get the metadata into my existing MAM. Yeah. But I also have a, an interface, a search bar, a Google search bar, you yeah. know, into my archive just without having to do anything. I like that. I like that solution. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I suspect that uh, there will be others that follow suit, I imagine. Um, Probably. <laughs> the So tell me about the blurring of the lines between, uh, you know, dam the dams of the world and Wasabi, because you're now... There is this creates an overlap of sorts. Uh, how are you thinking about that? What do you think? What do you think it means to the evolving landscape of, of digital asset management? Yes, it's it's um, it's definitely a heady topic, and I think that the mam the mam world has always been a, a world that both fascinates me and terrifies me at the same time. Uh, when we were at Front Porch Digital, for example, we integrated with all the mams um, that existed at the time. And I don't, I would, I remember going to um, various customer sites and they would show me their MAMs and I was just like, oh my God, how, this is so complicated. I don't know how, how do you use this? You must, there must be all kinds of training and everything. Um, and they were very expensive, mm -hmm. very, 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 very expensive to, to, to implement. We had a, we had our own, we built our own MAM light. We always called it a MAM light called Diva Director. Mm. And this is, Diva Director is kind of where, I think I get my idea of what a MAM should be from, but it's not like the MAMs have a purpose. There's, there's a whole world of moving files around, keeping track of high res and low res and edits and all that, that I am willfully ignoring at this point because mm -hmm. that is important. And there, there's there, it is complicated and there are wonderful MAM tools out there to solve all that. But when it, when it, when I think about these customers that I spent so much time with the library and archives of Canada, the, you know, the, the library of, of the United States Congress, um, the fortune off archive, the, the USC show foundation, all of these archives have a kind of somewhat finite archive. Now there's, there's stuff that's new, that's born digital. And maybe they have parts of what they do that, that, you know, if you think about like, I don't know, NBC universal, are always making new stuff, but they also have an archive. And the people who are thinking about and maintain the archive have kind of different use cases from other people. So uh, when I when I think about blurring the lines, I really think about the customer. Like, what do they need? Yeah. What when they wake up and they go to work, what are they what do they have to do with their fingers and their hands and their brains on their computer? And if it's you know manage an archive, be the person who can fulfill requests for content, help them help other businesses, business units find things. I think, I think a, 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 a uh, an application like Wasabi Air is probably sufficient. Now there's always new, there's always features and things that can be added and improvements, but I don't want to take it beyond that. Right. Like I don't, I don't want to go further into the mam and dam world because I think that those existing systems are way better than anything we could build for those purposes. 
So it's yeah, I mean, you you look at a lot of dams. You know, there's complex permission structures and and a lot of govern implementation of governance and things like that 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 Wasabi Air doesn't do. So this in those cases, it sounds like Wasabi Air could serve the purposes of some folks uh, who don't need a dam or ma'am otherwise. And in other cases, Wasabi Air is populating uh, those dams or ma'ams to help them give them the handholds, the metadata for improving search and discovery within their own systems. Exactly. It's exactly. It's a source of more metadata. And and it's sort of a window into your objects that maybe, you know, your other MAMs don't have. Um, The other important thing too, is if you flip it, if you think about like S3, right? If I have an S and we've had customers who have had S3 buckets with hundreds of millions of objects in them. If you go into the AWS console, into the S3 console, there's no search bar, right? That's not part of object storage, Mm -hmm. you know, because it is, it's a separate concept. I mean, it's, you know, you, and you have to solve it with technology. You can't just search your object storage with no indices or, or anything like that, that, that otherwise it take, take a million years. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like that's where we, like, that's where we sit. We, 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 we are saying Wasabi air, Wasabi object storage now has a search bar. Yeah. You know, and we've, that's it. We focused heavily on audio and video today. Uh, does Wasabi yes. Air also work with PDFs, Word documents, images, just the same? It does. Okay. It does, it, and it's it's um it's 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 a good point because th- those are those those open up being able to process that opens up whole other worlds. Uh, you know that that we don't spend a lot of time thinking about, but we we will. We're going to start because. You know, and, and video and audio too is not just limited to media and entertainment as well. I like to think of, for example, law firms, and you know, hmm. maybe there's a case and there's discovery, and they get a huge dump of data, and that data might include security camera footage of a pool gate, or you know, video or interviews and depositions, and, yeah. and not just all the PDF. And I think you know, if you were if you were opposing counsel and you wanted to, you know, give give these this law firm a really hard time send them boxes of, of documents and, you know, you can't search boxes and boxes of documents, right? There's no insight into that. Um, or say, oh yeah, I'll, I'll scan it for you. You scan it and you send them PDFs, but they're not, they're, they're just pictures, still not searchable. So I think making, making PDF searchable, making Word docs searchable, pulling out, you know, images that might be embedded in these things, processing those with object detection and logo recognition and all sorts is is a, a very valuable space that Wasabi Air does today. Yeah. Um, you just got to put it in the bucket. Well, Aaron, it has been so fun talking to you today, uh, geeking out. Uh, I just, it's really <laughs> exciting. Uh, and and your your career path and, and your recent accomplishments have been uh, just you know, game changing, I think. So uh, thanks for sharing your insights and being so generous with your time today. I do have one final question for you that I ask all the guests on the Damn Right podcast, which is, what is the last song you added to your favorites playlist? Oh, boy. Um, You know, I have to admit something that's going to be, that's going to divide your audience uh, in an extraordinary way, (laughs) which is that I actually own a Cybertruck. Okay. I, I'm also a child of the 80s. So the the whole Cybertruck aesthetic really pleases me. In fact, if you were to just crack open my brain and dive inside, it's like basically would be the interior of the Cybertruck. And the music that would be playing is the kind of a whole genre that I've only recently discovered because of the truck uh, is sort of 80s synth wave. Uh-huh. So um, I've, I've recently added to my favorites, some very obscure eighties synth wave music that, um, I could, I could look up. Yeah, if, would, for please, folks please do. Well, we, we have a, a, a soundtrack where I add all of these songs to a playlist that we share. So, so recently I, I, uh, added a song called haunted by a group called power glove. Okay. Awesome. And the power glove is, has a space in it. It's power glove. Good to know. Because had, there's also a band called Power Glove right. that doesn't have a space. <laughs> Good to know. We learned yet another thing right at the tail end of the podcast. Awesome. Well, Aaron, yes. thank you so much. I'm very grateful for your time and your insights today. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Do you have feedback or requests for the Damn Right podcast? Hit me up and let me know at damnright at weareavp.com. Looking for amazing and free resources to help you on your damn journey? 
Let the best damn consultants in the business help you out. Visit weareavp.com slash free hyphen resources. And finally, stay up to date with the latest and greatest from me and the Damn Right Podcast by following me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash in slash C Lucinic.